Welcome, and thank you so much for joining us for the second lecture in the We Were There series. This one is to acknowledge 40 years since the discovery of Legionella. This series was started to enable individuals who learned and experienced uh, Sentinel CDC outbreaks uh, to share those insights and stories so that those of us can continue their work. And now for a few words from the current CDC director, Dr. Frieden. I'm looking forward to this session, so I'm gonna be very brief. You'll hear about uh, cracking the case in Legionella. Uh, it's a story of persistence and hard work. Uh, and it's a number of firsts. The first time uh, anyone took a computer into the field, I understand. <laughs> In fact, it was the first time I heard about CDC. And I can remember sitting at the breakfast room table with my family and my father reading about uh, CDC identifying Legionella. And he said, you know, CDC, that's a pretty good organization. <laughs> Technology that we use evolves, and we have now really fancy tools. Um, but getting to the root cause of a public health problem is still a challenge that requires a uh, sophisticated look at the data, uh, understanding what's really happening in the field, dedication and hard work, uh, following intuition, boots on the ground, uh, and it shows the importance of our laboratories, which are essential to all of CDC's progress and success. When the job is done and crises are resolved, uh, people uh, return to their work often without much public acclaim. But even if they don't make headlines, they're the heroes and nonetheless, definitely people to whom we owe tremendous thanks. So we thank everyone involved in the identification of Legionella for all that they've done and think of all the people who have been diagnosed and treated with this disease since 1976. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Frieden. And now a short video to take us back to 1976 and thank you to the CDC Museum for lending us the video. Good evening. In the past few days, a virus-like mystery illness has killed 15 persons and hospitalized at least 42 others. All of the victims had gathered at the same convention in Philadelphia. A lot of people had died in a short amount of time, and people didn't know why. I got a call from my CDC supervisor. He said, we have a little problem with some pneumonias in Pennsylvania, Steve. I'd like you to drive up in the morning. As an EIS officer and as an epidemiologist, I had to learn what was going on. The two latest victims stayed here at the Bellevue Stratford Hotel while they were in Philadelphia. Two more people are now known to have died. One more death. Another death was reported that 110 persons are still ill, several of them critically. Specimens were brought back to CDC. All the cultures were negative. Quickly, we knew this was not a typical infectious disease. Well, what emerged with a series of hypotheses? Was it related to the food? where they ate, where they slept, where they partied. We asked about exposure to water and drinks and uh, liquor and cigarettes. And then all these sources of information are, are brought together in the line list. We make a big chart which would have every patient's name and any sort of thing we could think of that might lead to some exposure to some unknown infectious agent. All these various hypotheses were testing and coming to dead ends. We collected all the specimens we knew to collect. We asked all the questions we knew to ask. We just didn't know what it was. The death toll now 27. The latest victims, two men, Pennsylvania residents, American Legion members, and they had attended the convention. It was very frustrating for us at CDC not to be able to give an answer. So after three weeks, we went home and we wrote up our investigation. One of the people who read this thick memorandum um, was Joe McDade. I had been to CDC less than a year, just basically uh, one of the foot soldiers down in the trenches. He also went to a party over Christmas, uh, he's told me, and he got an earful from some guest at the party. Some of the comments were less than complimentary about why they hadn't found it. He was insulted by that and uh, went back to the lab over Christmas and re-examined his guinea pig slides. 
And then all of a sudden, what I saw was one microscopic field teeming with bacteria. So I knew I had something. He found it and named it Legionella pneumophila. We had a disease. We had a cause of this epidemic. Good evening. Federal health officials believe they've found the cause of Legionnaire's disease. And so it's really the combination of the people in the field and the people back in the laboratory, which has been the way that CDC's done it from the beginning. Maybe they'll find a better way sometime in the future, but I don't think so. And now to share some additional insights, I am inviting David Frazier and Joe McDade to come and tell us some of their stories. Thank you. At 9.15 Monday morning, August 2nd, 1976, a Veterans Administration physician in Philadelphia called CDC to report four deaths from pneumonia in people who had attended the American Legion Convention there uh, July 21st to 24th. His call was routed to the newly created swine flu unit which had commandeered the old Auditorium A, close by Clifton Road. First year EIS officers Phil Greitzer and Bob Craven, just out of the EIS course, received that call. They alerted the Pennsylvania State Health Department and sought an invitation for a CDC team. By that time, the known death toll had risen to 11. They set about gathering materials for the investigation, including materials for bacterial culture from Jim Feely's Special Pathogens Laboratory section. Feely alerted me uh, because I headed the epidemiology branch that partnered with his laboratory. I called Greitzer and Craven, offering Ted Tsai, also a first-year EIS officer, for the investigation team. I cited the occasional occurrence of pneumococcal pneumonia outbreaks as a, 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 an argument for having somebody in my branch included. Early that afternoon, the Pennsylvania Health Department invitation was received and a three-person team left for Pennsylvania. Tsai to Harrisburg, Greitzer to Philadelphia, and Craven to Pittsburgh. Early that evening, David Sensor called a meeting of all CDC personnel who knew something about the outbreak, and he asked Phil Brockman to designate a senior epidemiologist to head the field team, and Phil asked me to do that. So I left early Tuesday morning uh, to Harrisburg. What I'd like to focus on in my comments today are on a series of strategic decisions that uh, we had to make uh, to uh, focus the investigation. The first is the coordination of the state, local, and CDC teams. Pennsylvania's Secretary of Health, uh, Leonard Bachman, had made Harrisburg the headquarters for the investigation. That's the state capital. But who was to lead the investigation? After some discussion, we decided that Bachman and William Parkin, the state epidemiologist, would be the public face, would, head, would lead uh, press conferences, would direct public health nurses, and work with the American Legion. I asked only to be the supervisor of the EIS officers, which I assume would give me control over the investigation. Uh, <laughs> The state laboratory director, uh, Vern Pitko, would organize the collection, splitting, and shipping of specimens, uh, both to his laboratories and to CDC, where he would coordinate with Walt Dowdle. Lou Polk, the acting commissioner of, uh, of public health in Philadelphia, and Bob Sherrar, the infectious diseases director, would oversee Philadelphia Health Department staff. There were a number of challenges in this investigation. First, we needed a working definition of a case, a case of whatever this was. We needed to set up a surveillance system for a disease which was now spread all over Pennsylvania because people had dispersed from the convention in Philadelphia. And to that end, we used what was then a very uh, uh, impressive uh, a cadre of public health nurses to visit every hospital in Pennsylvania every day 
for the first seven or ten days of the investigation. We needed to collect specimens of various sorts, uh, from autopsies, we needed the serum, urine, uh, a sputum from uh, ill people, we needed paired serum uh, from uh, people with cases, as well as from household contacts of both cases and controls, in case uh, there was uh, turned out to be evidence of person-to-person -person spread. And then we needed environmental sampling, uh, for which Dusty Rhodes and George Mallison from CDC were very helpful in organizing. One of the very important things we needed was a denominator. Uh, the many, several thousand people had attended the convention in Philadelphia, but the American Legion did not have a master list of who attended. Uh, they didn't know the delegates, they didn't know the other legionnaires, they didn't know the, the women's auxiliary members or other family members who had attended. So we were uh, uh, first faced with uh, getting a denominator. The, uh, and then we didn't know what the agent was. Uh, the outbreak investigation started on the 2nd of August. By the 4th of August, we knew it was not swine flu. And within the week, we were pretty certain it wasn't anything we knew about. Uh, so that was a challenge. Uh, because we didn't know an agent, there was great press interest in the problem. There was uh, much public anxiety and conspiracy theories uh, around the bicentennial of uh, our country uh, cropped up. So much talk about phosgene and chlamydia and nickel carbonyl and other, other possibilities, some of which I'd never heard of before. The second set of strategic decisions that had to be made was around the organization of EIS officers and other CDC field staff. At its peak, we had 33 CDC staff in the field in Pennsylvania, not counting scores and scores of people working here in Atlanta and in, in other uh, CDC laboratories. Uh, one of the early decisions uh, I, I made was that every EIS officer should see cases of this disease, do a, do a physical examination, uh, read, read the charts, gather the information we needed to frame a case definition. Uh, and that definition ended up having a clinical part and an epidemiologic part. Clinically, uh, to, to, to be a case, one had to have chest x-ray uh, evidence of, uh, of pneumonia and uh, fever, or a temperature of 102 Fahrenheit or higher and, uh, and cough. To, to meet the epidemi epidemiological criteria, one had to either have attended the American Legion Convention July 21st to 24th, or have been in the Bellevue Stratford Hotel sometime after July 1st, prior to the onset of illness. In organizing the EIS officers, we, we arrange morning and evening staff meetings. And you can see, here is a picture of one of those staff meetings in the Philadelphia Health Department office building. Those reports would involve in the morning planning the work of the day and in the evening summarizing what advances we made. We divided the investigation into modular studies, which I think was an important part of dealing with such a large group of very bright, energetic people, so that each EIS officer had primary responsibility for one of these modules. Phil Reddick was in charge of what we called the 10,000 survey. This was our attempt to get a denominator. And so uh, what we did is work out an extensive uh, questionnaire uh, regarding uh, whether or not people were ill, uh, their age, sex, uh, medical history, what, act, what hotel they stayed in, what uh, uh, their activities were at the convention. And we had packets of this questionnaire delivered by the American Legion to each of the 1,000 American Legion posts around Pennsylvania. There, the commander of the post knew who had attended the convention and handed out the questionnaires to each person who had attended or to next of kin, had them filled out and returned them to us in Harrisburg for analysis, which let us know who had been there. Then, uh, let's see, Jim Shelton here, he was in charge of the hotel cohort study where we tried to figure out whether this was a problem just of the Bellevue Stratford Hotel 
or of other hotels in Philadelphia. So we had police detectives from Philadelphia calling random samples of, of hotel guests and asking them whether they, who had been registered in the weeks before, the week of the convention, or the weeks after the convention, to see whether there were, were, were any other clusters of uh, clinical illness similar to that of Legionnaire disease. And we're able to show that there the only cluster was in the, the week of the Bellevue Stratford, of the, uh, of the convention. Then uh, Walt Orenstein with Carlos Lopez uh, was in charge of a zero survey of hotel employees. We thought if we ever found an agent, it would be very nice to know, have some uh, serum from, uh, from the uh, employees. Bob Gunn over here and Dick Keenly side here were in charge of a case control stud phone survey of male legionnaire survivors, where we were, we were asking additional questions, uh, largely chasing down the possibility of airborne spread later in the uh, August investigation. And then earlier in the uh, video, you saw Steve Thacker. He was in charge of the line list. That was his central responsibility. And uh, it, uh, that uh, turned out to be very, nothing could get onto the line list without Steve Thacker's approval. <laughs> When we moved the headquarters of the investigation from Harrisburg to Philadelphia after about a week, uh, I made the decision that we should house the Harrisburg team in the Bellevue Stratford Hotel. Uh, th there were rooms available. The, <laughs> the price was good. And, and I was thinking if maybe there's a residual chance that there's, the agent is still being disseminated and we could uh, uh, catch a break with that. Um, now, there were, there were some glitches along the way. We had an episode in which three EIS officers, uh, let's say, dis uh, had uh, unauthorized uh, removal of the data from the uh, health department building. They took it home with them and be deciding that they could do better analysis, the three of them overnight, than the rest of us could do uh, during the day. Uh, this, this was uh, a, a, a dicey situation. It's never been talked about in public before. Um, I conferred with Phil Brockman about what I should do about this, uh, and we decided not to penalize anyone. Uh, their motives were good, even though the action was arguably uh, mutinous. <laughs> the, uh, I'll, privately, I can give you their names later. <laughs> the, uh, at the end of the field investigation, after three weeks, we knew of 221 cases of pneumonia or severe respiratory disease and 34 deaths. Of those, 182 were Legionnaire's disease, meeting the criteria I told you about. The other 29, uh, pardon me, the other 34 were um, what we call broad street pneumonia. They had the clinical uh, evidence of this disease, but they hadn't been at the, at the Bellevue Stratford Hotel or at the convention. They had been within a block of the Bellevue Stratford Hotel after July 1st and before their illness. Broad Street pneumonia, Broad Street is the street on which the Bellevue Stratford is located, and of course a tip of the hat to Jon Snow. The um, incubation period was two to ten days. Uh, the risk factors were being a formal delegate, having advanced age, being a cigarette smoker, having underlying disease. All known tests for infectious, a infectious agents or toxins were negative. There was no person-to-person -person spread. Of the household contacts of people who'd been at the convention, none of 193 developed clinical symptoms of, uh, of Legionnaire's disease. And the attack rate among uh, roommates of of cases was approximately the same as the attack rate among roommates of controls. The, um, there was no association with specific rooms or activities at the convention, no food evidence of foodborne or arthropod-borne spread. There was a weak association with drinking water at the Bellevue Stratford Hotel. But 38% of the cases had drunk no water there, and none of the Broad Street pneumonia cases had drunk water at the hotel. It appeared to be uh, oh, oh, and there was an association in non-Legionnaires with that week of the convention uh, and no association in other weeks before or after. It apparently was an airborne problem because 
risk of disease was associated with time spent in the lobby of the hotel or on the sidewalk just outside the hotel. That led to the third set of strategic decisions that we had to make, and that is the how to manage the transition from a sprint to a marathon. The team had been working 12 to 16 hour days for three weeks. Each night I reported to Phil Brockman in a telephone call that would begin at midnight or one or two and last about an hour. As the field work ended, a new extended but less fevered uh, phase began in the investigation. To manage that transition, first it was important to capture all of the information that had been generated in the field investigation. To that end, each EIS officer wrote up his or her investigation module before leaving Pennsylvania. My understanding is that these write-ups are in the collection of the Smithsonian Institution. Then there was the need to find ways periodically to inject fresh insight and new energy into the ongoing investigation. Uh, I had very much in mind the, 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 the challenge of Pontiac fever, which had occurred in 1968, a respiratory disease of unknown cause in the health department building in Pontiac, Michigan, that had a very intense CDC uh, investigation. Uh, extremely frustrating that went on for two years and there were many CDC investigators both epidemiologists and laboratorians who who bore the emotional scars of all that work that hadn't uh, led to to an agent I was worried that that uh, that some people who'd had that experience or I'd heard about it would want would shy away from working on Legionnaire's disease and repeating that experience. To try to inject new ideas, we brought together a group of outside pathologists on September 8th and 9th to talk, to go through the slides from uh, fatal cases of Legionnaire disease and tell us what they saw and what implications that might have for further uh, laboratory and epidemiologic investigation. They concluded that the main pathological lesion in these cases of uh, of, of lung disease was acute diffuse alveolar damage, not pneumonia, not, not a, a, a more typical pneumonia, which seemed to point uh, perhaps more toward a toxin, uh, maybe a viral illness, than, than certainly a bacterial illness. In October, on October 7th, we brought together a group of senior clinicians and epidemiologists from universities around the country to go through the epidemiological and clinical data to uh, advise what we might have missed. John Bennett, the uh, head of Bacterial Diseases Division, took me aside at one point during that fall and said, when and if you find the agent of Legionnaire's disease, you will solve the outbreak that I could not solve in 1965 that I investigated as an EIS officer at the St. Elizabeth's Hospital in Washington, D.C. He said, that is the same disease. And of course, he turned out to be right. We had some positive interchanges during the fall trying to generate this, uh, the, the, this additional energy and, and new insights, uh, presentations of the American Public Health Association, the Infectious Disease Society of America, ICAC, and so. We had some negative experiences. Uh, Representative John Murphy of Long Island uh, decided we should have a hearing. Uh, to point out all of the errors that center, the Centers for Disease Control uh, had made in, uh, in mi mishandling the uh, Legionnaire disease outbreak. So Luke Polk and David Sensor and I, I can't remember whether Walter Dattle had that uh, experience or not, um, we spent two hours uh, being uh, excoriated by, uh, by Representative Murphy. And then uh, in early November, Ted Tsai, and I and, and others finished the draft of an EPI-2, the memorandum that was mentioned in, in the video. Um, and I, I took copies of that around to many laboratories, both in the Bureau of Epidemiology and the Bureau of Labs, what, wanting to thank uh, laboratorians for their work up to that point and, uh, 
and then to encourage them to continue their investigation. At which point, I would turn the podium over to Joe McDade. very much. At the time that I first came to CDC, there were two main organizational groups, the Bureau of Epidemiology and the Bureau of Laboratories. Uh, I was assigned to the leprosy and rickettsia branch in the Bureau of Laboratories and worked under the supervision of the late Charles Shepard, which is shown here on the right uh, with me and a photograph that was taken about that time. Uh, Shep had expertise in both areas, although he spent most of his time working on leprosy. Uh, my activities were mainly involved with the rickettsial work, although we both worked together on uh, Legionnaire's disease. Now, at that time, for the period, CDC then, again, had excellent analytical capabilities and diagnostic capabilities, and it wasn't very long until just about everybody in the Bureau of Labs seemed to be involved. After influenza and a few of the other usual suspects were eliminated from consideration, uh, everybody was asked to rule out various possible etiologies. Uh, my task was to rule out the possibility that the disease was Q fever, the letter Q, meaning query, uh, which didn't seem quite plausible to me at the time. Um, well, first of all, um, Q fever was associated with contact with domestic animals or their environs, although you could also become uh, infected by uh, consuming unpasteurized dairy products. But more importantly, Q fever was rarely fatal, but nonetheless decided what I would do is to go through the diagnostic algorithm. Well, Q, uh, rickettsia as a group pre present a bit of a problem in terms of diagnosis because as many of you know, they're obligate intracellular bacteria which can only be grown in living tissue. And there was a well-established algorithm for diagnosing Q fever at the time. You used experimental animals, guinea pigs, uh, took a clinical specimen from a patient and inoculated it to a guinea pig. And after a suitable incubation period, if they developed signs of infection, usually fever, you would collect tissues from that animal, patchage them into embryonated eggs to get a, an established culture in the yolk sacs of the egg for further characterization and identification. And so that's exactly the procedure that I started to, that I followed. So I got a bit of lung tissue from one of the patients and using some buffer made it into a suspension and uh, inoculated the guinea pigs. And I expected to wait quite a time until they would see fever because usually with Q fever, an incubation period of maybe seven to 12 days. But after two or three days, all of a sudden they developed very high, high fevers. And I recall coming back to the lab that morning after checking the animals, saying out loud to nobody in particular uh, that the animals really seemed unusual to have such high fevers at that time. About 45 minutes later, I got a call from a reporter from the Atlanta Journal-Constitution wanting to know about the results of my experiments with guinea pigs, which of course turned out to be a very brief conversation. But at any rate, it, it didn't seem like Q fever, but I went through the process anyway. And so it was sort of like this. I would collect the tissues from the guinea pigs. And the first thing that I did was make impression smears on glass slides that I would stain and examine under a microscope to see if they contained any rickettsia. Second thing I did was make that into a suspension, the tissues into a suspension, and put several drops of that on different bacteriologic media to see if any bacteria were present. And then I inoculated the remainder, uh, some of the suspension, into embryonated eggs to try to cultivate rickettsia. But before I did, I added uh, a solution, a bit of a solution of antibiotics, which were commonly used at that time in rickettsia work. They were designed to inhibit the growth of most common uh, bacterial contaminants, but allowing the rickettsia to grow. Well, the results did not seem particularly unusual. Uh, nothing grew in the embryonated eggs, which uh, suggested no rickettsia were present, no Q fever rickettsia, which was not unexpected. I found nothing growing on any of the bacteriologic media. And when I looked at the stains and the smears of the guinea pig tissues, I would see an occasional rare rod-shaped bacterium. At the time, I was trying to think what it might be due to, uh, my conclusion was that it was probably normal bacterial flora from human lung tissue, because basically that was all that the people in the bacteriology labs were finding in their cultures 
of tissues that they were studying from the epidemic. And uh, the other way of looking at this course was uh, to see whether or not there were any elevated levels to Q fever, rickettsia, and convalescent serum specimens. And all those, specim all those tests were just stone cold negative. So at that point in time, I thought, well, what caused all this fever? And I thought, well, the possibility, it could be some sort of a toxic compound, uh, which was very consistent with the thinking at the time. So having ruled out Q fever, I felt my job was done back to my day job and didn't really give it much consideration other than occasional discussions with people in the labs. And it was sometime as David sent, I think it was in November when he brought back his Epi-2, which is very thorough but very concise. If there's anything that you can think of, let me know. And I thought, well, you know, I didn't know that there was necessarily anything that I could do at that point. Then came uh, the turning point in December. As mentioned in the, in the video clip, my wife and I attended a Christmas party and engaged in a conversation with a man, never told me his name, and I, I didn't know him, and chatting a bit about Legion, uh, Legionnaire's disease, and all of a sudden he got a little bit more aggressive. And uh, I don't remember what he said exactly, but I do remember him saying, everybody knows all you scientists at CDC are kind of weird. <laughs> And he said, but you know, we, we, we count on you to figure these things out. He said, there's something out there that's killing people and it could do it again, and, and we don't know what's causing it. He said, that's really scary. Well, it was a hit, you know, personally and professionally to think about that, and I thought about it in the next few days, but still didn't quite know what I could do. But then um, my, my compulsive nature took over the following week. It was a week between Christmas and New Year's and something I've done for as long as I could remember. I always cherished the quiet in the lab at that time, long before cell phones and email or anything else, and hardly anybody was there. Time to clean up your desk, clean up the lab, and get ready for the new year. And I remember going into the back lab where the microscope was, and there was a um, wooden slide box and had the slides from the guinea pig tissues, and I thought, well, you know, I should probably take one more look at these before I file them away. So I started looking, and same thing, I would see a few occasional rod-shaped bacteria and then I came across this exact, this is the exact bacteria, uh, slide that I saw. Now on the upper hand corner, what you see is what may to you look like sort of just a blob of stain. If you look carefully on the periphery, you can see some rod-shaped bacteria. If you focus up and down with a microscope, which I obviously can't do here, it was clear that there was a cluster of organisms were there, which said to me, this is something which is actually growing there. I don't think that this is something that I can overlook. So I'm hooked, I have to do something about it. I said, well, before you find out what it is, you're gonna to have to be able to grow it out. I thought, I know how I'm gonna do that. It didn't grow before. I thought, well, I'll try something a little different. I'll get the leftover guinea pig suspension. I'll put it back in the embryonated eggs. And this time I won't add any antibiotics. And so several days later, the embryo shows signs of infection. I dissected out some yolk sac tissues and I stained them and looked at them microscopically, and this is what I saw. You can see the many rod-shaped bacteria there, and that long serpentine chain is actually a whole long chain of bacteria which uh, had not separated whenever they divided. Well, at this point, I discussed it with Dr. Shepard, and we both agreed that the first thing that we really needed to do was to find out whether or not it had anything to do with the outbreak. And so Shep went upstairs and talked to Gary Noble, who was head of the influenza laboratory at the time and had some legion, legionnaires disease specimens on hand. And he brought us down a handful of convalescent specimens. And so the logic here, of course, is to look for antibodies in those serum specimens to the bacterium, which would be evidence of causality. Those tests were set up by the late Martha Reedus, who was a wonderful person, an outstanding technician, and Vern Newhouse, who was our staff epidemiologist, was in the lab at the time. I'll spare you the details of the laboratory testing, but the bottom line is if any antibodies were present to the bacterium in those serum specimens, that whenever we looked at that slide underneath the fluorescent microscope, they would stain bright green. And this is what we saw. So by that time, you know, we, you know, it looks like we might be on to something, and it was early evening, but nobody was going anywhere. Uh, Gary Noble gave us another set of specimens. This time they were all coded. They were acute and convalescent specimens from the outbreak. 
there were specimens from patients with other pneumonias and as well as some normal control serum specimens from the serum bank. And Martha set up the test again and we both read them. And at the end we broke the code and it was very, very clear. All the controlled specimens were negative and all the Legionnaire's disease specimens either showed uh, a rising titers to this bacterium or standing high titers. So coming days, obviously, the pace of serologic testing picked up. Many more specimens from the Legionnaire's disease outbreak, as well as many other specimens control type that we added in. And finally, I think it was oh, somewhere maybe, I think it was either Thursday or Friday, June 13th and 14th, the week before uh, Jimmy Carter's presidential inaug uh, inauguration. Uh, we went to visit uh, Dr. Sensor at his office to tell him what we had, and there were some other people present. I, I, I don't know who they are, so I don't know who they were, so I can't tell you who was there at that time. Shepard, being a very cautious investigator, wanted an extended period of time to rule all possible uh, outlying factors, even repeating the experiments in a different lab to make sure it wasn't something that was in our environment that was causing uh, us to pick these up. And I, Discussion went back and forth, and the last thing I remember Dr. Sensor saying is, let's see where we are next Tuesday. <laughs> well, next Tuesday, there was a special edition of the MMWR that was in press. Uh, Shepard evidently had uh, worked in preparing that over the weekend. It contained the results of our serologic testing, as well as some of the salient epidemiologic features. I remember, I'm pretty certain it was that exact same day that Shep and I went back and talked to David Sensor again. This time we had some additional results to report. 14 specimens from the St. Elizabeth outbreak in 1965. We also had tested those. 13 of the 14 were also positive to the same bacterium. Um, I understand, but I can't confirm that they actually held the presses of that special um, MMWR article while they inserted a three or four line statement uh, putting those results that were in there. Well, at any rate, uh, within a day or two, specimens are coming in from everywhere. Martha and I are right up about here with requests for testing, but it became very clear, very clear that the tedious process of trying to uh, grow this organism in embryonated eggs and using experimental animals was gonna be very rate limiting, and we needed to learn how to culture the organism on bacteriologic media. Well, try it again, but if you weren't successful the first time, why would you be successful now? Well, first of all, we thought at least that we had a pure culture of the organism so that if it was very slow growing, it would not be overgrown by any other contaminating organisms that might be there. Secondly, the yolk sacs were very highly infected. We had large numbers, and sometimes that's very important whenever you're trying to establish, um, whenever you're trying to establish growth of an organism on a new uh, medium. And sometimes, too, what you can have is a carryover of nutrients that might come from the yolk sacs, which might be beneficial in getting it started. And so I gave uh, this yolk sac to Bob Weaver in the bacteriology division. I think he inoculated 18 different bacteriologic media multiple times, incubated them at various different concentrations of CO2 and, and um, temperature and whatever. And finally, after about a week or so, he started to see growth on one particular plate. And it turned out that it was miller hinton auger, but it was the supplement that was important. It was isovitalex that contained iron and most importantly, the amino acid cysteine. Well, that was not still a very sensitive kind of a culture medium, and it needed to be improved. And so I would be very remiss if I did not mention the efforts, absolutely Herculean efforts, of these two people and their staff at improving the media. Uh, George Gorman on the left and the late James Feely on the right and their group who one by one added an ingredient, subtracted an ingredient, incubated this way and that way, and finally came up with what was Feely Gorman auger and served, uh, served as well for both clinical testing and environmental sampling at that time. Still needed some improvements and it was additional improvements made by others over the years to provide the standard medium. The other thing that it enabled us to do, you could finally grow the organism free of any extraneous host tissues which allowed you to characterize the organism in great detail. 
And some of that work, which proved to be most important, was done by Don Brenner and Arnold Steigerwelt in the bacteriology division when they analyzed the DNA of the organism, which turned out to be a new species in a new genus in a new family, and it was called Legionella pneumophila. Well, something that was not well known at the time, but over the years at Walter Reed, they had also done diagnostic work uh, for various infectious diseases, and they also used guinea pigs as part of their work. And over the years, they had isolated four uh, rickettsia-like agents from guinea pigs, which they considered to be commensal uh, organisms, which they could not associate uh, with the patient's illnesses that were being investigated. And I was aware of that, and Shep and I ran into Marilyn Bozeman, who worked at Walter Reed, at the ASM conference in New Orleans, and we talked about that. She sent us uh, um, cultures of those four isolates, and Brenner and Steigerwald um, analyzed those again, uh, their DNA composition. One of them, an isolate made in 1947, was identical to Legionella pneumophila. Two others were the same species, one isolated in 1943, which was uh, identical to each other, but another species, and the fourth was yet another species. And at about the same time, working with Bill Cherry, Roger McKinney, uh, and Ann Abair and others in the bacteriology division, we were able to show that Legionella had more than one serotype. So that we knew that we were uh, c coming into something that was gonna be much more complex, but we had no idea what the complexity would be. So the question is, you know, always ask, how, how did we miss it? You know, how, do we, how did everybody miss it? You know, the people at Walter Reed had it in their hands. Uh, that was a very, very solid group of investigators there over the years. I followed a lot of their work. And I can only, I, I can only conclude that the relative uh, lack of sensitivity of serologic tests that were available during that period, all the way back to the 1940s, probably hindered them in any effort that they may have made to try to sh associate those organisms with the patients by antibody testing. Well, how did the people here and, and the other investigations, how do we miss it? Well, as you've seen, it wouldn't grow. And the other thing is you couldn't see it, okay? You couldn't see it. This is formalin fixed tissue that was stained by the tissue gram stain called brown bren stain. And what you can see are the lung cells that are there, but you cannot see any organisms. And so, um, afterwards, after we found out that they uh, likely were caused by a bacterial infection, the pathologist went back and used a very intensive silver impregnation technique uh, called the Dieterle silver impregnation technique to see if organisms were there. And this is what they found with the very same tissue. And it confirmed that they were, in fact, absolutely there. Well, how was I able to see it and they weren't? It, it's, it was fortuitous. It was fortuitous. The stain that you use for rickettsial testing is the active ingredients, carbofuxin, it stains things red. And remember that I stained fresh uh, guinea pig tissue and can, could see it. Later, Francis Chandler, who worked in the pathology lab, tried to stain formalin fixed tissue with carbofuxin and it did not work in his hands. So all of that was a fortuitous uh, circumstance. Well, finally, at the end, uh, there were the skeptics, and as they should be as they should be, health skepticism. It ranged from the conspiracy theorists uh, to people who had vested interest in other possible etiologies and to some who uh, absolutely scoffed at the idea that you could ever find a new infectious agent considered ranging anywhere from, you know, uh, outrageous to anachronistic to just virtually impossible. But eventually we won them all over and, and uh, it happened relatively quickly and it had not so much to do, had not so much to do with the serologic results that we presented. But more importantly, those results contrasted against a mountain, virtual mountain of negative test results that accumulated by the labs at CDC and elsewhere, every possible toxic chemical, toxic medical, biological, uh, toxin, infectious agents, all of which proved a negative. And one of my recurring um, memories of that period is of uh, all the people in the labs who slogged away at this, uh, coming up with individual results that were negative, 
all of which seemed uh, uh, insignificant, but when viewed in the aggregate, uh, gained increased uh, purchase. And as I think of it in another respect, it was very much like a, a jigsaw puzzle. Uh, the picture is never really entirely clear until the last piece is put in place. Thank you. And now a few words from, for, uh, to describe a more recent investigation from Dr. Isaac ben Benowitz. Good morning. As I was walking up here, I heard someone remember that those are tough, tough hacks to follow, and I certainly agree. <laughs> Um, so, uh, last summer, in 2015, the New York City Health Department investigated a large outbreak of Legionnaire's disease. It was the second largest outbreak in the U.S. after the 1976 outbreak that you've just heard about. Um, and now that I've given away the punchline, what I want to focus on is really some of the methods and tools that we used in that investigation. How we used some of the information that we've accumulated over the last 40 years, learning about Legionnaire's disease, to take this investigation um, in a very different way. Um, so even now, we know that Legionnaire's disease exists, but these patients really look, most of them look like a lot of other patients with community-acquired pneumonia. And so if you don't test for Legionnaire's disease, if you don't find it in the lab, you won't know that that's what the patient has. And while it does grow in culture, as Dr. McDade described, it doesn't grow in normal um, sputum culture that most patients would get in an outpatient or hospital setting. It only grows on special media, and most of the time those cultures aren't run. And so most cases are only picked up by a urine antigen test kit that's gained much wider use in recent years. In New York City, we get at least two or 300 cases of Legionnaire's disease every single year, all of them generated by that urine test. And we investigate all those cases, but most of them have nothing in common with each other. We define an outbreak or a cluster when we find often just a handful of cases linked to each other in space and time, and that's what triggers our investigations. On July 17th, we picked up a cluster, and we had a sense that we were onto something much bigger than our typical investigation. There were eight cases that had all had onset of symptoms within the last two weeks. They were reported to the health department just within the last four days before the signal was generated. But even then, we still had no idea what we were looking at, where these cases had come from. In the last 40 years, so many investigations of outbreaks of Legionnaire's disease, many of them um, led or joined by CDC investigators, have identified many sources of these bacteria in the environment. Um, shower heads inside buildings and other plumbing systems, um, water fountains and displays, uh, market misting systems, and cooling towers, which are um, heat dispersal systems that are on top of buildings. These systems capture heat from air conditioning and other industrial processes, and they capture that water into a tank, capture that heat into a tank of water, and then large fans blow off the heat, but when that water is contaminated with Legionella bacteria, it leads to aerosol dispersion that can go for miles around a single source. And that type of information is incredibly helpful in modern investigations because it tells us that we can use the distribution of cases to help understand where we might look for the source. So if we see several cases clustered in space and time and they all live in the same building or they've all visited the same building, it makes us think about an indoor source, something like shower heads um, or maybe a, a, some sort of decorative fountain. But when we find several cases that are linked in space and time, but they haven't been in the same building, they've just been in the same area, that makes us think about outdoor exposures, like cooling towers. Our investigation in New York City ultimately found 138 cases. There were 16 deaths, 12% mortality rate. And we think that it's the, that there were the attributes of the neighborhood really helped us to understand why there was such severe morbidity and mortality. This outbreak happened in the South Bronx, a very poor and immigrant-heavy area of New York City, very high levels of poverty, um, number of people going without needed medical care, many people who smoke, and many people with chronic diseases, including diabetes, um, HIV, and others. We spent a lot of time going around doing a traditional epi investigation. We talked to all of those people. We asked them where they had been, where they had spent time during the two weeks before their illness onset. Um, and what we found was that Many of them lived in this one area, about six square miles, over seven zip codes in the South Bronx. 
And that was all that linked them. They hadn't been in the same buildings. Um, they certainly didn't live in the same building. There were some people who, like the Broad Street pneumonias in Philadelphia, had spent time, had visited this area, had gone there to work, um, but didn't live there. And so, again, we knew we were on to some sort of outdoor exposure, and we didn't know what. We, we stood on the shoulders of all those prior investigations. We knew we were looking most likely for a cooling tower. And so at this point, we wanted to find all of the cooling towers that were in this area. But this is, this is six square miles. It's a densely populated area. There are a lot of buildings, a lot of commercial activity. And there was no list of cooling towers. The, nobody requires you to permit your cooling tower. No one requires you to register it with the city or with anyone. And so that was our real challenge. Where, where are the cooling towers? We found some of them through some city administrative data. Sometimes when people put up buildings, they list in their, in their building permits that there's a cooling tower. But often these are installed later. We spent a lot of time searching aerial imagery, actually sitting at our desks looking at Google Earth. Um, you can look at a neighborhood, you can zoom in on every single building, and like this picture shown here, you can find the cooling towers from above. Um, we actually talked to a, a rapid response team from Google and asked them whether there was a way to computationally search these neighborhoods, and they said, well, you know, really having people look at the pictures is probably gonna be your best bet. Um, we found a total of 55 cooling towers in this area, a huge number to um, visit and sample, and so we plan to sample all of them prioritized based on the clustering of patients' homes as shown here, which are these green dots. Um, this shows the cooling towers, and it doesn't show all of them. So what I'm showing here, the triangles are the cooling towers, and the ones in red are the ones where we did a rapid test using PCR for Legionella DNA. This is a quick test. It doesn't tell us if there's viable bacteria in the cooling tower, but it tells us basically whether Legionella have been there any time recently. And that was enough to let us act quickly. At this point, there were still dozens and dozens of case reports pouring in, a lot of people getting sick in the community. We knew that waiting until we could culture environmental samples would put us back a week, maybe two weeks, before we could start closing down cooling towers and forcing them to clean up. So these red towers, within 24 hours of when we collected samples, we had PCR results from our state laboratory. That was enough action, that was enough information for us to issue commissioner's orders to all these cooling tower owners to shut down and start remediation while we did additional testing to figure out which one actually matched all these patients. And we found one. Um, so this is the PFGE, pulse field gel, gel electrophoresis block from our early investigation. That first row at the top shows a single PFGE pattern that matches all 26 of the patients for whom we were obtain, able to obtain isolates. We didn't get isolates from all of them. This is actually a very good showing that requires a lot of additional lab work from all of the hospitals involved. That second row shows the PFGE pattern from what I'll call cooling tower A. One cooling tower near the center of the outbreak with a PFGE pattern that is indistinguishable from all of those patients. These other rows show the PFGE patterns from other cooling tower isolates in this area and none of them matched our patients. We were excited. We found the source. We had, we put together a big press conference. This is Mary Bassett, the Commissioner of Health for New York City, um, announcing that the outbreak is over. We've found the source. It matches. It's coming from a cooling tower. We shut down the cooling tower weeks ago. It's cleaned up. There have been no more cases. Hooray. Um, Unfortunately, in the real world, public health is sometimes a bit more complex. We went back a few days later after we issued orders for mediation at all of the cooling towers in this area, and we collected additional samples to make sure that cleaning was going well, that we hadn't missed anything, and we found something that didn't turn up on our, our initial sampling. A second cooling tower, that I'll call cooling tower B, had Legionella bacteria. We hadn't found any bacteria when we had sampled at that tower originally. And furthermore, the PFGE pattern exactly matched cooling tower A and all the patients. And so this is a problem. We've already made a big media splash. We've announced that we found the source. We've cleaned it up. Did we name the right source? So this is a problem. Um, and so we had to move beyond our very good laboratory results from PFGE and figure out what, which of these sources was actually the cause of the outbreak. Um, we were able to 
throw some statistics to it. We looked at the clustering of the patients' homes, and even just looking at this photo, you can, this map, you can see that the cases are, do seem to be more strongly clustered around Cooling Tower A, um, but that wasn't enough to really convince us. We went back to the laboratory, and we used whole genome sequencing. So this is really advanced technology. This is something that our state laboratory um, up in Albany had just developed in the previous months using some seed money from CDC. There'd been a smaller Legionnaires outbreak about a year earlier, and they said, you know, we really want to start developing a whole genome sequencing pipeline. And they had just built this. They ran through all of our isolates from this outbreak and a number of earlier ones. And so this um, diagram here shows the relationships of all of the Legionella isolates by whole genome sequencing from New York City over a several year period. It's a little complex, but it's actually pretty simple. The, large, the larger dots represent more isolates that match each other, and the shorter lines represent closer relationships. And so this large green dot, large green circle, represents cooling tower A and all of the patients for whom we obtained isolates. They all matched, not a single sequence was different. And that little brown circle off to the right is cooling tower B. It differed by one single nucleotide polymorphism, also called a SNP, and it didn't match any of the cases. <laughs> and we had a big sigh of relief because we had named the right source. Um, but when we take a step back, we also realized that this is 40 years after a team of CDC and Pennsylvania investigators discovered that Legionnaire's disease existed and that it could be um, spread by cooling towers. Um, over the past 40 years, there have been a number of guidelines written to help cooling tower owners um, manage the possibility of contamination in their systems. And a lot of these outbreaks, I think, help to demonstrate that those guidelines on their own are not having the impact that we need them to have. We need to do better to ensure that cooling towers are maintained properly, that we don't have these bacteria floating out into the air for miles and miles, leading to the severe pneumonia. And so in New York City, we took the next step. We worked with the health department and the city council. We passed comprehensive rules for, cleaning tower, for cooling tower registration, maintenance, and cleaning. And so this law, we call the cooling tower law, is the first of its kind in the United States. It represents what we see as a shift in the focus of cooling tower maintenance from engineering upkeep to public health risk reduction. It's intended to decrease the Legionella contamination at cooling towers across the city and to reduce or eliminate the outbreaks that result from that. And so looking back over 40 years, a lot of the tools are similar. We've used some very new laboratory methods, um, but I really think that this is hopefully a new era where the addition of regulations in addition to the guidelines and knowledge will move us even farther to reduce the possibility of Legionnaires cases and outbreaks in the US. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Frazier and Dr. McDade and Dr. Benowitz. Um, appreciate your insights. And now I would ask that they return to the stage and that uh, Dr. Lucas and Dr. Kuntz <laughs> and Laura come up and, and share some of the insights that they have um, from the work that they've done on Legionnaires. And while they're taking their seats, I'm going to um, remind you of uh, who was involved in the in initial investigations. So I would just like to make a quick start uh, to give a little perspective from then and now. And I hope it's been very apparent that from the very beginning, uh, Legionella and Legionnaire's disease has required on the microbiological side the forefront of technology. 
um, back in 1976 that entailed the creation of entirely new artificial media, new diagnostic techniques, new serological techniques. In 2016, we're looking at whole genome sequencing and a lot of new um, DNA-involved techniques. So we've gone from having a problem identifying the organism to having a problem figuring out which one of the organisms we found was actually resulting in the outbreak. And I think moving forward, as we try to increase the prevention efforts, uh, we'll use the microbiology to kind of direct those, target those, so we can identify the strains of Legionella that are most likely to cause a problem. Hi, uh, Jason Koontz here from uh, National Center for Environmental Health. Uh, we closely partner on the Legionnaires' disease effort. Uh, so environmental health expertise is key to understanding and addressing the environmental factors that allow Legionella to survive and reach a susceptible host. You know, for example, water temperature, water flow in buildings, uh, building pipes and disinfectant levels can all affect Legionella growth. So due to the sensitivity of Legionella to environmental factors, environmental practitioners are ideally situated to provide expertise essential to both responding to Legionnaires disease outbreaks and preventing uh, future ones. So environmental health response in Legionnaires disease outbreaks helps improve prevention practices by translating these lessons learned into evidence-based prevention guidance for building managers and owners, really getting to the root cause of the outbreak. At CDC, the structure of Legionella activities has evolved over time. Representatives from the three core disciplines, we call it the three-legged stool, of environmental health, lab, and epidemiology participate in all major discussions regarding Legionnaires' disease prevention and response. So a current priority is to build environmental health capacity in public health departments so that measures to prevent the growth of Legionella in building water systems are both promoted and adopted. Hi, I'm Laura Cooley. I'm a medical epidemiologist with the Respiratory Diseases Branch. Uh, the rate of reported legionellosis cases has increased 286% over the past 15 years. The reason for this increase is likely multifactorial. The higher rates could represent a true increase in the frequency of disease uh, related to factors such as a greater number of, of people at risk, um, either due to underlying illness or immunocompromising uh, medications an aging U.S. population, and uh, maybe an aging uh, plumbing infrastructure. Uh, increased testing for Legionnaires' disease could also be playing a role. But even with this increase, we think Legionnaires' disease is likely underdiagnosed. Early diagnosis with appropriate clinical testing at, for populations at risk is a vital step to reducing the number and size of outbreaks. Prevention, though, is uh, really the key to reversing the increase in incidence, as the vast majority of reported cases are never linked to a particular outbreak. A new industry standard for prevention of Legionella amplification and transmission in building water systems uh, was published in 2015. It describes uh, the use of water management programs in buildings with large and complex water systems. This year, CDC and its partners developed a toolkit to facilitate implementation of this new standard, which we were able to share um, via an MMWR um, vital signs release in June. The goals of these activities was to raise awareness uh, of the increasing problem of Legionnaires' disease so that clinicians will more um, frequently order the appropriate diagnostic tests and that building owners and managers will take the steps needed to improve prevention. Is it all right to ask a question? It is. It is, it is now. We are now opening the floor to questions, including from a panelist to another panelist. <laughs> Yeah, if you're opening it up, um, just first, uh, thank you so much for um, coming back and, and coming down from New York and sharing with us the sort of history and the, the future of Legionnaires' disease. There's so much to comment on, you know, it, it's, it was just um, tremendous. But there were a couple things that um, Dr. Fraser and Dr. McDade talked about that I think are really important for us to hear today. One is how um, helpful it was to have criticism. That it, I hadn't really realized that it was that, you know, hearing us attacked at the Christmas party that really motivated you. <laughs> and so we, we are in an era where attack and criticism is common, but I think the, the idea that it can be a motivator is helpful. Okay. And then the other, the other comment is um, your, your remarks, Dr. Fraser, about consciously trying to figure out how to transition from a sprint to a marathon. So I think the past several years at the agency, we've really been... Um, sprinting through marathons, and, and the idea that you were thinking through 
how, uh, how are we going to keep uh, engagement, motivation, especially after you know, negative experiences in the past? Uh, I guess maybe just the third thing is um, uh, since both of you, uh, both of the investigations talked a little bit about the politics, I wonder if people want to expand on that more because I, I remember hearing that it was quite political in 1976 and, and I understand it may have been recently as well. So opening it up for you to explore those themes. You know, um, as, as long as <clears throat> 10 or 15 years uh, after this outbreak, seemingly on anniversaries, I could almost count on a telephone call from a journalist uh, talking about many things, and almost always the topic came up about how the stories in the newspaper must have influenced what I was doing, okay? Seems self-congratulatory to me, but um, <laughs> truth be told, that, that had, for me personally, had absolutely nothing to do with it just prior to coming to CDC. I had been out of the country for five years, rarely saw an English language paper had a little TV this big, which I've seldom looked at or whatever. Um, you know, the man at the Christmas party, you know, I'll, I'll never know. It certainly got me thinking about it again, but I think it was ultimately for me, it was a matter of a certain amount of, you know, uh, only this audience can appreciate the true value of being compulsive, okay? <laughs> <laughs> and um, it got, it, I wouldn't put those slides away without looking at them one more time, okay? It was my week, and if I found something that was there, I knew it would drive me nuts uh, until I figured out what it was. At that point, I thought it was something innocuous. I just needed to identify it. So, I, you know, I don't know how people respond to various things and uh, various stimulus from the outside. Certainly, you cannot inure yourself to that. But I think for everybody in this room, it's the fire in the belly that keeps you uh, going. I mean, certainly the people who slog away in the trenches anonymously during all these outbreaks, dotting I's and crossing T's, because they know ultimately it contributes to the, to the, to the final picture. So I don't know how to judge that, just my off-the-cuff reaction to it. I might add uh, uh, observations about the role of the press in this in, in 1976. There were three reporters uh, with whom I had quite close contact uh, during that time uh, from the New York Times, from the Washington Post, and from the Philadelphia Inquirer. And uh, two of those reporters did a great job, um, uh, very impressive. Uh, and, and I found my discussions with them to be quite helpful. Uh, the third uh, was trained as an EIS officer. Um, and, uh, and, and he got a, a theory, or heard a theory from s uh, some scientists, uh, and decided to shape his reporting uh, to support that theory, and ran a series of articles in the New York Times about nickel carbonyl being the cause of Legionnaire's disease. And uh, the Washington Post reporter came up to me after the second or third of those stories and said, my editor asks me when I'm going to file a story about nickel carbonyl. And uh, I, I've, I've told him, I, I don't see a story there. Dave, tell me, am I missing something? And I said, you're not missing anything. Uh, it's this. This is a, a, an idea that's uh, taken on its own life, quite unrelated to the science, either in the laboratory or the epidemiology. And so we need to uh, not be swept up by it. And could add that, um, that David knows this probably just slipped his mind for the moment, that the uh, source of nickel carbonyl was eventually traced back to the scalpel blades that were used for preferring the tissues uh, during autopsy. Now, first, thanks to all of you for spectacular talks. I'd like to ask Dr. Fraser and Dr. Benowitz why their epidemic respectively ended. Mm -hmm. Ask the question again. I, my my why, why presbycusis did, is, is getting to Well, I have the same. Um, <laughs> why, why did the epidemics end in Pennsylvania and in New York? I don't know.
I also don't know. Um, so it, it, there was there was an interesting moment, you know, as Dr. Fraser described, you know, a few days into his his team's investigation, they knew that they weren't sure what they were looking for. In ours, we knew what we were looking at, and <clears throat> it was probably about a week and a half in. We were tracking down all of the cases as fast as we could. We were building our epi curve, and one day. Um, Don Weiss, who's one of the medical epidemiologists at the New York City Health Department, was the lead on the investigation, sent an email around to the team and said, you know, look at that epi curve. And what he had pointed out was that we had very quickly narrowed down the source. We had forced the cooling tower to shut down. And the epi curve had tailed off a little too fast. Um, we, we, our actions in closing down that cooling tower and forcing remediation are not what stopped the outbreak. They're what prevented it from recurring at that, from that cooling tower or another one. Um, but Legionella has its own life cycle. Um, there was a chlorine treatment system at that cooling tower. Um, somewhere in the days before we got there, the level of Legionella had gone down low enough that it wasn't still posing a threat to the neighborhood. We don't know if that's because the weather was cooler and the cooling system wasn't running as hard and wasn't dispersing as much, um, whether Legionella was doing something on its own. There's still so much science to be defined with this organism. It has like seven different life, life stages and I, mean, I don't know whether Claire has to Yeah, talk so about this is where anymore. I think the, the modern era can maybe help inform some of this because um, as Isaac said, yes, there is a Legionella life cycle. It, it it's, uh, grows. It's a, a the parasite of the protists that live in the environment to begin with. We haven't even begun to define its host range. It's very, very broad, which is why it causes problems for us. But we're also looking to metagenomics to kind of get an idea of what other organisms are there in the the milieu that the Legionella are. And as Isaac mentioned, you know, they found another strain that was almost identical to the one that caused the outbreak just down the road, but it didn't seem to be making anybody sick. I doubt that it was due to that one single base pair change. It was probably something else in the environment. That's what we need to figure out now. Follow up, may I ask a question on that? Um, um, maybe I'm oversimplifying this, but it sounds like a lot of the effort is placed on uh, Legionella in the water once it comes out of the pipe, you know, as opposed to watersheds, water use, water reuse, and all those other kinds of things which gets down to the basic ecology and how the organism thrives and grows and whatever. And so m makes me wonder if you go upstream, hate to use that analogy, but certainly true that um, you can get even a better idea about prevention as opposed to worrying about decontaminating cooling towers and other things. And I don't know whether there's anyone in the research community, not necessarily at CDC, that's looking at it in a more ecologic, broader sense. So yes, actually, there, there are many people who are looking at the ecology of Legionella. Um, we have lots of colleagues in the US and around the world. Um, some of the things we've discovered is that the distribution of strains is not really even. Um, the Northeast fortunately or unfortunately, seems to have a preponderance of the strains that we know are associated with large outbreaks, whereas perhaps in the southwest of the United States, those strains are not as prevalent. Um, other countries may have different species altogether. Australia tends to get Legionella long beachy as opposed to Nemophila. So there's a lot we don't know about the distribution of the organism. There's a lot we don't know about its persistence and colonization. And one thing I think we need to really remember is this is a man-made disease. Um, it's the distribution systems, it's the aerosolization, it's the warm water and cooling towers that allowed this organism that evolved into the environment to become a problem for humans. So we need to figure out what about our modern society we can change to fix that problem. Uh, I'm David Bell, Division of Viral Diseases. Uh, I really love these talks and I, I couldn't resist a personal comment. I was in Philadelphia in August 1976. I was home visiting my parents in between third and fourth year medical school. Uh, and all this was going on. It was in the papers every day, as you know. And so I, I, I was already interested in CDC, but this was the first time my parents understood what CDC did. 
I, I previously never quite been able to explain it to them. Um, so I, I thank both of you for that. And it was certainly wonderful to come here in 1979 as an EIS and meet you. But the other thing that didn't quite come out is that this was Philadelphia's premier hotel. We, we didn't have a Ritz-Carlton, we had the Bellevue Stratford. And it, it was a magnificent building in the center of downtown with uh, you know, doormen and all that. And for, for this to happen in this hotel, was was just amazing. I, I mean, you, and 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 the hotel, um, it, well, it later went bankrupt. I mean, it, it, after it was over, the governor and the mayor stayed overnight there to try and convince people it was okay. It didn't work. Still went bankrupt. So, but it, it was just great talks. Thank you for doing this. Yes, I, I have a couple of comments because I was an employee at the time myself and not too long after played on the same softball team called the Rocky Mountain Spotted Fielders with uh, <laughs> Joe McDade. Uh, Dave Frazier, you mentioned the organizational names, the Bureau of Epidemiology and the Bureau of Laboratories, and back then that was it, other than the cafeteria and maybe the snack bar. So. CDC was a lot simpler organization, but uh, a, a sign of the political pressure at the time was that there was an unprecedented step taken. We were ordered in every laboratory, no matter what part of the Bureau of Laboratories we were in, to shut down our normal operations and to take specimens from a central location that was on the first floor of Building 7 in Gary Noble's area of operations that I had to go up to and, and literally work as a ferry boy to all of the laboratories and, and coming into a room that looked like Grand Central Autopsy Suite, where there were pulmonary tissue, spleen, and every other type of post-mortem sample that had been taken from the, the deceased patients in Philadelphia and being sliced, diced, and distributed to all the laboratories at CDC. And that's all we did for that entire week. And of course, as you said, all the results came back negative because we were ordered to look for what we were specialized in working on, and it all came back negative. And I don't think that's ever been even approximated. And uh, Steve Monroe turning around, you would have had apoplexy because in this lab, people were still mouth pipetting, <laughs> something we were trying to to get some of the old timers to stop doing even, even then. <laughs> it was a very difficult situation, but I, I just wanted to relate that story. That, that CDC shut down, the, the whole laboratory operation shut down just for this effort. And I don't think that's, that was done either before or since in that manner. Thanks, Jim. Um, yeah, follow up on that comment, mainly uh, for Dr. McDade. And, um, as you pointed out and Jim just mentioned, I mean, there was a lot of uh, important work by laboratory staff, you know, looking for what we knew to look for um, and the negative results. But it strikes me this is a case where, you know, the quote that most advances in science are not accompanied by eureka, but rather than, well, that's weird. Um, <laughs> and so I, for me, the lesson here is to not so quickly discount things to say, oh, well, I've looked for my bug and it's not my bug, so I'm going to try to go back to my normal day job. But this notion of, you know, finding that one weird result and, and taking it to ground to figure out what's really going on. And so I guess the question is, you know, how can we make sure that the current generation of staff in the lab have that same belly in, uh, fire in the belly as you described it so that when they get something weird, they don't just discount it, but they try to uh, run it to ground to figure out what's really going on. You know, that theme is repeated so many times. One of the books that I read many years ago, I'm trying to remember the exact title, Thomas Kuhn's book, The Structure of Scientific Revolutions. Have you ever read that? At any rate, um, it's on a much broader scale, but basically what his thesis is that um, we all get locked up in paradigms and the Earth was the center of the universe, and if something didn't work with that, it was some sort of anomalous observation that you throw away or you get thrown in jail. And um, over time, his, 
his theory was is it's the anomaly that really pushes things along either at a greater or, or longer scale. And um, you know, you can think about it even in molecular terms when you people were studying ribosomal DNA and transfer DNA and messenger RNA and throwing away all the rest that's being useless and now you find the small interfering RNAs that direct so much of transcription and translation and affect uh, everything that's done. So looking at those that way, I, I can tell you that was not my mindset at the particular time to do that because I was very, I, to me it just didn't seem like a credible thing, go ahead and do what you look for and then move on. And it was only when you saw something that just drove you nuts that you had to do something about it. it, it I think it'd be useful if you ever have some time. You know, it's not exactly beach reading, but it's, um, I, I felt it was a very interesting thing, which kind of changes the way you look at things. Hi, Cindy Whitney with the Respiratory Diseases Branch. Now, obviously, the way we investigate these outbreaks is we would look at the epi curve, we would recognize this explosive onset of cases, and we would do the kind of investigation that Isaac described where we would go look at the cooling towers and try to quickly sample them. Um, in, the, in your case, in Philadelphia, you obviously wouldn't have had that association with cooling towers. Um, so did you, once you identified the bacteria, did you try to go back and figure out how the hotel might have given this, spread this to the people, and are we sure, do we, do we really understand which cooling tower this might have came from? By the time we were able to grow this bacterium from environmental specimens. The specimens were already more than a year old. And we wouldn't have uh, recovered Legionella from, from those specimens. I can re recall talking with George Mallison about the cooling towers on the top of the, of the Bellevue, the cooling tower on top of the Bellevue Stratford, and him describing how cooling tower uh, effluent uh, uh, moves around in urban environments. Uh, and, and, and what we observed as an outbreak, I think, was quite consistent with that. That is, the, the drift is e exhausted out the top of a cooling tower. It tends to layer across the roof of the building and then is drawn down the sides of the building in these canyons, of, in urban canyons. The air intakes for the lobby, for example, uh, were, came off the side of the building. And it would have been quite possible for that drift to come down the side of the building and be drawn into the lobby, as well, of course, as uh, onto the, the sidewalk. But we never nailed that down in, in Philadelphia. That was, that was inference that largely was advanced by uh, Joe showing that Pontiac fever was uh, caused also by Legionella pneumophila. And uh, the, the, the role of the evaporative condenser in the health department building in Pontiac had been very well worked out by the investigators at the time in 1968. We just didn't re recognize the relevance of that work in 1976 until Joe could, could tie it to Pontiac fever. Hi, my name is Jeff Markani. I'm in the Legionella Lab here at the CDC. I want to say thank you very much for all of your insight. It was a wonderful presentation. <clears throat> Something that we don't often get a chance to do is name things here. And I mean, that, that, those days seem long gone for finding lots of new things that we get to name. And so I've had the opportunity to read a lot of documents um, related to the original uh, Legionnaire's disease investigation. And one of the things I I didn't come across much of was a discussion of how to name the bacterium. And I was wondering if there was any discussion amongst yourselves as far as how do we go about naming it? Do we name it for ourselves? Do we name it for the people that are infected? And I was wondering if you had any, any notes on how that was actually decided. I can comment on that. Um... I, I don't know what the, um, the, the procedures are now. Um, and maybe Steve Monroe can tell me about the virologists. The virologists, of course, the viruses get their names, there's a lot of the arboviruses, at least, by the location where they're found, you know, like Zika virus found somewhere in South Africa, I think. Uganda. Uganda, yeah, in Uganda. In, in the bacteriology world at the time, it seemed to me that there were 
two usual ways of doing. Uh, some of them were honorific, where the person who isolated the organism, the organism would be named after that person. And so that was an option that was presented to me. And uh, I, I did not think that uh, that was appropriate because actually Legionella went all the way back to the 1940s and there were so many other people who had worked on it. And I actually, to get the name down, I was hopeful that the organism would turn out to be primarily one that infected lung tissue, which is why I came up with the name Pneumophila, having an affinity for the lungs. And Legionella was intended to be honorific uh, and reminding the people from that convention. And I think we also had some representatives from CDC talk to the American Legion folks to find out whether or not they would uh, consider it that way. The other factor in naming it that way, uh, we lose a lot sometimes in our scientific history um, when we don't connect it with uh, something or some place. And I think by naming it Legionella, uh, it would always bring people back to that initial outbreak, which then conjures up uh, exactly its explosive potential, its epidemiology, and so on. And so after getting all the spelling, whether to put an A or an E or whatever, and I discussed it with a very knowledgeable person in CDC at the library at the time, make sure my Latin uh, was correct. We uh, decided to name it Legionella nemophila, and another species later was named after Marilyn Bozeman, who provided the sea isolates and so on. And so that's sort of how that came about. Thank you. And thank you. Susan, do you have a question? No question. Just want to remind everyone that's watching, we have a new website for this lecture series. Please take a moment to go there. And if you worked on Legionnaire, share your story with us on the website. There's a place you can email us and, and share that information, and we welcome that. Um, so do take a minute and, and go to the site. This particular um, recording will be posted within the next couple of weeks on that site. And our first in the series, which was um, May 25th is already live on the site, so in case you missed it, you can go see that now. Thank you. And I'd like to take a moment to um, ask anybody who has worked on a Legionnaire's outbreak to stand and be acknowledged, please. Thank you again to our, our presenters and to the uh, museum for lending us the video. Uh, we appreciate all the support and the work that you've done. Thank you.